banging the virtual gavel. The Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Nonproliferation will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations and the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with remote committee proceedings of HRES 8, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they are not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a forum and will now recognize myself for opening remarks. I want to thank my good friend, the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, um, the members of this subcommittee and our witnesses and, and members of the public for joining us at today's hearing focused on the important role of liberal norms and values in U.S. foreign policy towards the Indo-Pacific. You know, I've been very troubled by the democratic backsliding in countries across the world. According to the annual Freedom House Freedom of the World Report, 2020 saw the 15th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. Unfortunately, some of the most significant climbs, declines were in our region in Asia. Having traveled um, you know, pre-pandemic to the region in 2019 and early 2020 um, to both Sri Lanka, Nepal, Malaysia, um, I was struck by the struggles some of these young democracies were experiencing, as well as the increasing challenge authoritarianism poses for fledgling de democratic institutions. Civil society organizations, journalists, and hum human rights activists are routinely targeted for supporting liberal norms and principles. We also saw some countries in the region introduce and adopt legislation that discriminates against ethnic minority populations and undermines the country's secular identity and commitment to pluralism. These worrying trends regrettably intensified with the spread of COVID-19, um, during which we saw some governments further back down on freedoms of the press and expression in efforts to silence criticism or otherwise exploit the health crisis to fortify their power over the opposition. From the genocide of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, to the military coup in Burma, to the political crisis in Samoa, it's clear U.S. engagement with this consequential re region must also grapple with the ongoing challenges to democratic norms and values. I applaud the Biden administration for the work it has done thus far to restore values at the center of U.S. foreign policy, such as working with allies and partners to impose sanctions on Chinese officials for their human rights abuses in Xinjiang, and to promote cooperation on Taiwan, as well as issuing the National Security Study Memorandum on Combating Corruption. I fully agree with President Biden's February speech on America's place in the world, that American leadership must meet this new moment of advancing authoritarianism. To do that, we must work to strengthen our democratic institutions at home as we continue to support human rights, democracy, and freedoms internationally. U.S. partners and adversaries alike need to know that our commitment to these liberal norms is not a bargaining chip, and that commitment will not change just because a strategic competition is afoot. That's why I'm particularly pleased to have our witnesses today who will help us better understand the Biden administration's strategy for pushing back authoritarianism and the role that democratic values play in our approach. Questions like, how should the United States better help struggling democracies in the face of spreading authoritarianism? In particular, how can the United States better support the next generation of young people, often seen driving the necessary political changes as we've seen with the protests in Hong Kong and Thailand and the civil disobedience movement in Burma? How should we hold our adversaries and allies alike accountable for undermining democratic norms and, and values? How can we better message our approach and our unique strengths when the U.S. Um, adversaries are playing by a different rule book that attempts to undermine the liberal world order? I look forward to our witnesses' testimonies in today's hearing, and now we'll yield um, five minutes to my friend from Ohio, our ranking member, Representative Steve Shabbat, for his opening comments. I want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Barra for uh, holding this important hearing today. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our panel of witnesses for providing their insight 
um, on how the Biden administration intends to protect uh, democratic values and advance human rights and the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific uh, in an era of strategic competition. In the 25 years that I've served in Congress and on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, I've always tried to make uh, the promotion of human rights a top priority. Uh, during that time, we've witnessed multiple countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, transitioning towards democracy. Uh, we've also seen democratic backsliding, as the chairman mentioned, uh, often at the hands of violent authoritarians with the tacit or explicit support of those who wish to see democracy fail. Today, however, our support for democratic values in the region takes place against the backdrop of great power competition that is really an ideological rivalry between two competing value systems, that of the United States and our fellow democracies, and that of the Chinese Communist Party. At home, Beijing has shown a blatant disregard for human rights and the rule of law, whether it's their dismantling of democratic institutions in Hong Kong, or they're committing genocide against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in China. Abroad, the CCP's efforts to undermine trust in democratic institutions and use political and economic pressure to promote their form of authoritarian government uh, are totally at odds with our values. For instance, we know that the party's most fervent desire is to extinguish the light of democracy in Taiwan. And Beijing is attempting to test the strength of other fledgling democracies across the globe through corruption, disinformation, ruthlessly aggressive economic practices, and foreign interference in democratic processes. Make no mistake, the CCP will continue to subvert freedom and democracy uh, in the Indo-Pacific and beyond until either it does or it doesn't reach its goal of regional and ultimately global hegemony. In this era of strategic competition and in the wake of a global pandemic, it's crucial that the United States remain actively engaged in the Indo-Pacific to strengthen democratic institutions and provide countries with a model of governance that protects the rights of its people and promotes transparency and accountability. Finding the right approach to addressing human rights abuses while competing with the PRC, however, is critically important. We don't wanna push countries into the PRC's arms, nor can we sacrifice our values. It's this administration's task, therefore, to advance both our interests and our values without compromising either. That said, now is not the time to tread lightly. Doing so would put vulnerable countries at greater risk. Uh, in particular, I'd like to highlight Cambodian and Burma, which uh, Cambodia and Burma, which have witnessed alarming democratic backsliding in recent years. As co-chairman of the Congressional Cambodia Caucus, along with my uh, Democratic colleague Alan uh, Lowenthal, uh, we've consistently denounced Prime Minister Hun Sen's increasingly repressive campaign to stamp out democracy in Cambodia, uh, and will continue to do so. Human rights and the protection of fundamental uh, democratic freedoms are integral to our bilateral relationship. So far, international condemnation of visa sanctions have not compelled Hun Sen to respect the rule of law. And so we must do much more uh, in Cambodia. And I want to commend uh, Congressman Lowenthal for his uh, determination in this area. And it's been a pleasure to work with him. In Burma, we've witnessed the disintegration of democracy in real time. On February 1st, the Burmese military seized control and detained top political leaders. Since then, several hundred innocent people have been callously murdered and thousands more have been arbitrarily detained, including Americans. This brutal coup is a blatant uh, violation of the rights of the Burmese people who, to their credit, have been courageously and peacefully protesting these heinous crimes. These recent events only add to the atrocities carried out by the Burmese military against the Rohingya, which have left over a million people displaced. We must continue to stand with the people of Burma in their struggle for democracy. That's why Congressman Levin and I sponsored a resolution condemning uh, Burma's military for their assault against democracy and why I sponsored a resolution in 2018 that called the atrocities against the Rohingya what they were, genocide. Both resolutions passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support, demonstrating our commitment to human rights in Burma. While there's still much work to be done in the Indo-Pacific to protect and promote freedom, the rule of law, 
Um, I still believe democracy will prevail. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses on how the Biden administration intends to achieve these important goals. Thank you for holding this uh, hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you um, to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat. Um, let me now introduce our witnesses. We have Mr. Scott Busby, the Acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Mr. Dean Thompson is the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. Mr. Um, Francisco Ben Kosmi is the Senior Advisor to the Acting Assistant Secretary for East Asia and Pacific Affairs Bureau. And last um, is Mr. Craig Hart, the Acting Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for East Asia and the Pacific for USAID. I thank all the witnesses for being here today and will now recognize each witness for five minutes. Without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. I will now invite Mr. Busby for his testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member uh, Shabit uh, and the others of the committee who are here today. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity you've given me and my colleagues to appear before you today to testify on the very important and timely issue of democratic values in the Indo-Pacific region in an era of strategic competition. I would also like to thank the committee for its continued leadership in advancing U.S. values and interests and supporting our engagement in this region. The administration is committed to putting democratic values at the center of U.S. foreign policy because doing so holds the key to achieving our interests. The United States recognizes that our own prosperity and security are inextricably tied to the Indo-Pacific region, and so the region is a leading U.S. foreign policy priority. We seek to maintain strong ties with the peoples of the region by amplifying the role of civil society in protecting and promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms, including through our innovative democracy and human rights programming. While democracy expanded across the Indo-Pacific after the Cold War, more recently, we have seen backsliding. Some governments have sought to increase control over their populations, triggering an erosion of respect for human rights fundamental freedoms and democratic processes and institutions. In addition, the Indo-Pacific region is increasingly troubled by provocations, economic coercion, authoritarianism, and malign influence. Information manipulation, whether it is through media capture, censorship, or disinformation campaigns is a global problem. China actively seeks political, economic, and strategic advantage including through the spread of propaganda and disinformation and silencing critical voices. Disinformation has profoundly changed how people vote, obtain health care, and treat vulnerable members of minority groups. Responsible governments must not suppress factual information nor permit their officials to contribute to the spread of misinformation. The PRC government is increasingly pressuring nations throughout the region to subordinate their freedom and autonomy to a, quote, common destiny, close quote, under a PRC sphere of influence. Beijing has invested heavily in efforts to degrade U.S. strengths and prevent us from promoting and defending our values and our interests and upholding the international rules-based order. The PRC continues to refine its brand of techno-authoritarianism and deploys and proliferates technologies, both old and new to this end. We continue to support the PRC's neighbors and commercial partners in defending their rights and autonomy. To address these challenges, democratic partners and allies remain an important strategic asset and expanding our engagement with them is central to achieving our human rights and democratic governance goals in the Indo-Pacific. This was evidenced by the president's decision to hold his first bilateral summit meetings with Japan and the Republic of Korea where our joint commitments to democracy, good governance, and human rights were reinforced. We are also increasing our engagement through the Quad, ASEAN, the Pacific Islands Forum, and of course, the United Nations. Our early re-engagement with the UN Human Rights Council, which is recently rejoining the Council's core group on Sri Lanka and helping to advance the Sri Lanka and Burma resolutions, demonstrates our renewed commitment to joint action. We have also increased our coordination with like-minded allies 
in imposing costs on those responsible for human rights abuses and undermining democratic values in the region. This is reflected in the sanctions we and others have imposed on senior Burmese military officials responsible for the coup and the entities that support them, as well as the parallel sanctions implemented on March 22nd by the US, EU, UK, and Canada against PRC officials and entities responsible for the egregious human rights violations in Xinjiang. In an effort to buttress democratic governance globally, President Biden has committed to convening a global summit for democracy to ensure broad cooperation among allies and partners on the values we hold most dear. The summit will be an acknowledgement that all countries have different challenges on the path to democratization, and we all, including the United States, must institute reforms and recommit ourselves to these universal values. From the PRC's genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, dismantling of Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy, to recent backsliding on democratic governance in Sri Lanka, the military coup in Burma, and the ongoing pervasive repression in North Korea, we are grappling with a wide array of human rights challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. We describe with greater specificity in our testimonies these challenges and how we are seeking to address them. Mr. Chair, promoting democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific region is not just the right thing to do, it also advances our strategic interests by building more stable and prosperous societies. It supports our economic goals, it empowers citizens to hold their governments accountable, and it aligns American leadership with the aspirations of everyday people in the region, strengthening bonds that we hope will last for generations. With continued U.S. engagement backed by congressional support, we will continue to emphasize that the promotion of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law benefit the Indo-Pacific region. We will continue to consult closely with you on our path forward and are pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Lesby. I now invite Mr. Thompson to give his testimony. Thank you, Chairman Vera, Ranking Member Shabbat, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify on democratic values in the Indo-Pacific in an era of strategic competition. I'm honored to be here today alongside my colleagues. From the world's largest democracy in India to one of its smallest in Maldives, the democratic tradition remains strong in South Asia. That said, homegrown challenges centered around constraints to freedom of expression, association, and religion threaten those traditions, a threat that is compounded by the malign influence of governments such as China and Russia. This makes the work we do to bolster these governments and citizens' abilities to recognize and combat this malign influence that much more important. Sri Lanka is Asia's oldest democracy, and its elections are largely free, fair, and nonviolent, despite a troubled history. While we have pledged to work with Sri Lanka's democratically elected leaders, we take seriously the challenges posed by the increased militarization of government functions and diminished space for civil society. Nepal is a young federal democratic republic that has made admirable progress in its democratic journey. Observers have characterized elections as generally well conducted. At the same time, President Bhandari dissolved parliament for the second time in five months on May 22nd. While the past year has seen continuous political infighting, it has remained within the confines of the law and disputes have been settled through the courts. Bhutan is a democratic success story in South Asia. It has held three elections since its king abdicated absolute power in 2008. The most recent election in 2018 was widely viewed as free and fair, and the reins of government passed peacefully from one political party to another. In Maldives, we've seen a clear expression of the Maldivian people's commitment to democracy, with nearly 90% of eligible voters casting ballots in the 2018 presidential election. India remains the world's largest democracy with a strong rule of law and independent judiciary and enjoys a strong and growing strategic partnership with the United States. However, some of the Indian government's actions have raised concerns and are inconsistent with India's democratic values. This includes increasing restriction on freedom of expression and the detention of human rights activists and journalists. 
the United States regularly engages India on these issues, including the important work of civil society. As is the case around the world, the PRC government uses a combination of economic levers and soft power to pressure South Asian countries to align with its interests and smaller countries are especially vulnerable to this pressure. Common issues among South Asian countries include strong ties between local political elites and PRC economic interests, widespread political and economic corruption, and a lack of ready alternatives to PRC financing, creating a climate of dependency. These conditions limit the flexibility and independence of many countries in their bilateral relationship with the PRC and can weaken their institutions and rule of law. To assist these countries in facing these challenges, the United States employs a number of strategic uh, programs aimed at helping them increase their national resilience by strengthening their core democratic values. In fiscal year 2020, state and USID, USAID bilateral assistance for democracy to South Asia totaled almost $69 million, or 14% of our South Asia total. In Bangladesh, Bhutan, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, SCA supports these objectives through the $14 million South Asia Governance Fund, our small grants program run in partnership with the Asia Foundation. Projects support, supported by this fund seek to strengthen civic part, participation and democratic norms, enable citizen access to credible information, build trust and participatory governance, and increase communities' resilience to foreign and malign influence and corruption. Public diplomacy plays an outsized role in supporting and strengthening efforts to mitigate malign influence. Every speaker program, American space event, cultural collaboration, media interview, social media post, or exchange program is part of a sustained long-term campaign to build core democratic values, empower local voices, and build networks that can challenge foreign malign influence. Mr. Chairman, thank you and the other members of this committee for your continued support of these vital efforts. Our ability to invest our time and resources on these critical issues in South Asia remains in our national interest. Our support for democratic values and human rights helps build a more free and open Indo-Pacific region, enhances good governance, improving security, and facilitating human development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, I now invite Mr. Ben Kosmi to give his testimony. And I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You are, Chairman. Thank you so much. Chairman Berra, Ranking Member Chabot, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify alongside colleagues and to share our views on democracy and human rights issues in East Asia and the Pacific. There is no question that trend lines on human rights continue to move in the wrong direction. We see it in the genocide and crimes against humanity being committed against predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and other members of ethnic and religious minority groups in Xinjiang, and in the repression of Tibetans' distinct language, religion, and culture, and the ongoing repression of human rights and fundamental freedoms across China. The people of Hong Kong see the reduction of their freedoms every day. The coup in Burma is another example of this discouraging trend. Governments in the region are increasingly considering laws and regulations that would restrict the activities of NGOs or enhance government monitoring of them and have increasingly diminished freedoms online in places like Vietnam and Indonesia. We see it in the attacks and the imprisonment of opposition politicians, anti-corruption activists, human rights defenders, lawyers, and journalists. I would summarize our strategy in promoting democracy and human rights in two ways. The first part is ensuring that democracies deliver both here in the US and in the Indo-Pacific. And the second is helping promote accountability for serious human rights violations in the region. On their first overseas trip to the region, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin stated, it is strongly in our interest for the Indo-Pacific region to be free and open, anchored by respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. This is a goal that Japan, South Korea, and the US share, and we will work together to closely to achieve it. In the first few months of the Biden-Harris administration, we have hosted historic summits with both of those key allies and with the Quad. In these engagements, we have not only made countering the coup and the human rights crisis in Burma a key facet of our diplomacy, but sought to ensure that democracies like Japan, Korea, and Australia can deliver for their people. 
That means whether it comes to issues like vaccine, diplomacy, climate financing, or inclusive economic growth, delivering and ensuring U.S. leadership is present are vital to countering growing authoritarianism. As Secretary Blinken has made clear, the test America and other democracies face is to analyze the challenges we face and make changes to more effectively deliver for our citizens, because failing to do so only gives rhetorical ammunition to autocracies like China. Second, we have worked hard to promote accountability in the region, to deter abuses from acting, abusers from acting with impunity. Just last week, we issued an executive order that would prohibit U.S. transactions relating to Chinese companies that export Chinese surveillance technology to facilitate human rights repression abroad. We condemn steps uh, by, the, by, by the Hong Kong government to ban Tiananmen commemorations and called for the immediate release of those who were arrested. We have sanctioned multiple PRC and Hong Kong officials and are leading an international coalition that will stand up to Beijing's ongoing genocide, crimes against humanity, and forced labor abuses in Xinjiang, as well as its human rights abuses elsewhere. On Burma, we have condemned the coup and horrific violence in the strongest possible terms and will continue to lead the international community in taking concrete action to promote accountability for the military's junta actions both before and after the coup. We have sanctioned coup leaders and military businesses and will continue to look for ways to deny sources of revenue that support the regime's repressive, undemocratic measures. Moreover, the coup has brought further volatility to a country already facing a humanitarian crisis for members of ethnic and religious minority groups, especially the Rohingya. Our alliances with the Philippines is our oldest in East Asia, forward in shared defense of freedom and critical to a free and open Indo-Pacific. We continue to promote democracy through sustained constructive engagement and have both publicly and privately raised concerns um, if pushed, and then pushed for further progress. We have continuously urged Philippine counterparts to investigate allegations of human rights violations and promote accountability for those responsible. On Cambodia, we are deeply concerned about the ongoing politically motivated trials of opposition members, journalists, and activists there. During her recent meeting with Prime Minister Hun Sen, Deputy Secretary of State Sherman underscored the importance of human rights and the protection of fundamental freedoms as integral to our bilateral relationship. She urged the Cambodian government to abide by its international and domestic human rights commitments and to assure the protection of worker rights. We will continue to press the government to reopen civic and political space in advance of the 22 commune and 2023 national elections. We will also work with like-minded partners to press for reforms in Cambodia. I've seen firsthand how Congress's partnership in this area has made a substantial impact on US human rights policy in East Asia. And I want to take this moment to thank Congress for their steadfast support for democracy and human rights in the region. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Ben Kosmi. I now invite Mr. Hart to give his testimony. Chairman Vera, Ranking Member Shabbat, distinguished subcommittee members, thank you very much for inviting me to testify on USAID's vital role in the Indo Pacific in defending and promoting democratic norms and institutions. We know that societies that respect and defend human rights and protect fundamental freedoms are more stable, prosperous, and secure, make strong trade partners, and are better equipped to confront global challenges. Yet throughout the Indo-Pacific, we face significant challenges for democracy assistance in a dramatically altered development environment. During a time when democracy was already under threat, the COVID-19 pandemic has, in many countries, accelerated to democratic backsliding and allowed autocrats to further consolidate power. While we shift significant resources to much needed medical, humanitarian, and economic responses to COVID-19, we must not lose sight of the need for robust democracy, human rights, and governance support. USAID is committed to integrating democratic programming throughout our long-term sustainable development approach, which is grounded in a strong understanding of the local context. This includes efforts to promote human rights, increase access to justice, foster accountable and transparent governance, enable an, an independent and active civil society, and safeguard political integrity. In collaboration with like-minded allies and partners, we are focused on countering aggressive efforts by authoritarian leaders and strategic competitors to undermine democratic institutions and so internal discord that drives polarization. In Sri Lanka, 
following the Eastern 2019 attacks. USA had trained youth from disparate ethnicities to counter divisive hate speech and disinformation on social media through networking and content that promotes pluralism and peace building. In Cambodia, we support the development and launch of the country's first fact-checking website that has since increased the national conversation about fact, fake news. And USAID is prioritizing its accountable governance work, including public administration, public financial management and oversight, transparency and the accountability mechanisms at all levels of government. In Nepal, for example, as the country continues to solidify its historic devolution of powers, we are helping foster greater accountability and transparency in the planning and management of public funds at the subnational level. USA trained local and provincial officials to use the country's federal level public financial management system, which provides a safeguard against public corruption and misuse of funds. In the Pacific Islands, USAID is working with the election commissions of Fiji, of Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands as they seek to conduct safe elections in the midst of the pandemic. In the absence of internal international observers due to the travel restrictions, we helped safely mobilize local observers for elections last August in Papua New Guinea. USAID is also expanding our support for human rights, rule of law, and citizen empowerment with an emphasis on addressing discrimination, in inequity, and marginalization in all of its forms. So in Burma, following the February 1st military coup, USAID immediately redirected $42 million of assistance away from the work that could have benefited the junta-controlled government. We instead directed the assistance to civil society, independent media, and life-saving activities that directly benefit the people of Burma. Across Asia, USAID has helped reduce the violence discrimination and stigma faced by LGBTQI plus people by supporting the development of 23 inclusive laws and policies over the past six years. We are enhancing equal access to justice for all. For example, in Indonesia, USAID has helped 10 legal aid partners increase the number of people they serve by more than 1,000% since 2017. And in Laos, USAID is helping the government to substantially increase its provision of free legal services by more than tripling its number of legal aid offices. In closing, countries with de democratic processes and institutions are more just, peaceful, and stable, enabling citizens to pursue and fulfill their potential. Yet in the Indo-Pacific, significant deficits in citizen responsive governance and respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and democratic norms, and institutions compromise stability and prosperity in a region which is home to more than half the world's population. While USAID has been adapting to meet these challenges, we also recognize that much more needs to be done, and we're looking forward to doing it in alignment with this administration's priorities and in consultation with the U.S. Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart, and, and thank you all for your testimony. I will now recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, I will recognize members by committee seniority alternating between Democrats and Republicans. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we will circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. Um, I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes of, of questioning. Um, and maybe this is a question for um, Mr. Thompson, you know, initially, you know, as chair, when I think about my travel schedule, I've pre pandemic, we've made it a, a point to visit some of these smaller countries that, that are younger democracies, you know, um, whether that's Sri Lanka, you know, we, we went to Malaysia, we went to Nepal, um, also the Philippines and you know, had a chance to meet with some of them the USAID workers as well as the NGOs on 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 the ground helping you know these these young democracies, Mr. Thompson. You know, my my sense is you know in in Malaysia and in your opening testimony you touched on it that 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 young parliament you know has struggled and and has backslid. Same in Nepal and you know while the Rajapaksa government looked like you know certainly it was democratically elected, it does look like they're putting in place some rules and in, in, in passing through parliament, um, some rules that, you know, could be considered anti-democratic. If you could give us an update on, on, on that region and go into a little bit more depth with those three countries in specific, I, um, that'd be great. 
Sure, Mr. Chairman, thanks for the question. And um, it was actually, uh, even though I'm covering South and Central Asian affairs now, I was in Malaysia uh, at the time of your visit, and it was great to welcome you there and have you come through. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Sri Lanka and Nepal and the situation in my region, and then uh, perhaps if, if there's a minute, uh, Francisco can, can talk about Malaysia specifically um, uh, since um, EAP covers that, that part of the world. But I think you're absolutely right. This is a, an area of concern that we, that we watch very carefully. You know that in Sri Lanka, uh, in October 2020, um, the president used uh, his coalition supermajority um, to pass constitutional amendment that consolidated power uh, and reinstated a lot of powers uh, that had, had been in the hands of the president previously, but had been uh, devolved out uh, under prior administrations. So, you know, it's always a concern when you see this kind of central centralization of power. But as you've rightfully noted, our work with civil society, our work with um, democracy building, uh, in these areas can be very effective and very uh, important in helping uh, these countries start to, you know, push back on on what uh, may be a, a consolidation of power uh, in one particular area. In Nepal, uh, you very rightfully noted that uh, the last couple of years has seen quite a lot of um, churn, I would say, in their democratic system. Uh, the president just uh, for the second time uh, in, in, in as many years, I believe, uh, dissolved parliament. However, I would say everything there has continued to proceed in a uh, uh, legal and democratic fashion. And so we continue to work with the governments there to see how we can, uh, how we can promote uh, where they're headed on that front. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop if you have more or, or if you want to hear from Francisco. Sir, you're muted. Um, Mr. Ben Crosby, if you want to give us an update on Malaysia. Yeah, no, similarly, we've seen um, a couple areas where there was a really abrupt transition of uh, power in Malaysia. We've seen um, attack on uh, human rights activists um, in sort of an uptick in a sort of discrimination and pushback of refugees, particularly the Rohingya um, in places like Malaysia, all really concerning trends. Um, and so at, at our embassy at every level has been trying to push and urge the government to uh, respect and honor their obligation, international obligations on human rights. But it's also the work that uh, USAID and civil society, as you mentioned, to you in, in sort of working in um, sort of local um, you know, uh, populations to really support um, a sort of a culture, support refugees who are trying to find um, you know, uh, a sort of a basic income inside the countries and also foster um, an area of sort of a, a respect for human rights within uh, the public population, so. Great, and in the last 30 seconds that I, that I have, maybe for Mr. Hart, what are some of our most effective tools that, you know, we can use to strengthen some of these civil society organizations and, and help, um, you know, these young democracies um, survive and thrive? Chairman Barra, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I, th I think that in terms of our approach towards civil society, one, we're not alone. And so we are working with like-minded partners to support civil society, but also media, parliament, um, looking specifically at Sri Lanka. We're, we're looking across the spectrum to make sure that there is complementarity between the systems. And so we're working with the, the courts, for example, to, to increase their effectiveness in the, of the judiciary establishing model courts that demonstrate, great, demonstrate greater uh, efficiency and transparency. We're also very much working with the youth across the board, but also in civil society organizations, is so much of the energy is there as well. And so looking for ways in which we can engage there as well as with the media um, and enhancing the media's ability to report on a live time basis, do fact checking, have those conversations with the civil society members that are that we're also supporting. All of those things come together. Great, thank you. And I've noticed my time's expired, so let me go ahead and turn to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, um, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't direct my questions at any particular witness. I'll let the uh, panel decide which one, and just one, if you would, because I got a number of questions. Uh, uh, past U.S. administrations have attempted to steer 
China toward behavior that's more respectful of human rights and the rule of law and democracy uh, using a range of policy tools, including U.S. assistance uh, for rule of law programs and Chinese civil society, uh, bilateral human rights uh, dialogues, uh, sanctions, uh, open uh, criticism sometime and, and various forms of engagement. Uh, nothing, quite frankly, seems to have worked very well. Um, what options are there uh, that this administration is considering for U.S. multilateral action uh, on human rights that might have some chance uh, of making some progress there? Well, thank you, Ranking Member Chabot. Uh, Scott Busby here. Um, we are looking to partner with uh, like-minded allies in speaking out uh, about the abuses in China and taking action against them. Uh, we are looking to do so in the Human Rights Council, for instance, as well as the General Assembly uh, and other UN uh, institutions. Uh, but as I noted in my testimony and as the chair also noted, uh, we're looking at taking tougher action as well, including the sanctions that we jointly, jointly announced with the announced EU, with Canada, and the UK. And I would note that those uh, jointly announced sanctions sparked a significant reaction uh, from the PRC, which to our mind demonstrates uh, uh, their effective effectiveness in getting the PRC's attention. So it's that type of uh, a joint action among like-minded allies that we're primarily Thank focused on. Thank you. Well, there, there's no question uh, that we do need to be tougher because uh, their behavior uh, virtually across the board has been abhorrent. And uh, I know that the previous administration tried uh, a whole range of things. Some things worked, some things didn't. And I would strongly encourage this administration uh, to, to move forward on that. Um, by uh, many accounts, uh, the U.S. and India, as the world's two largest democracies, are uniquely poised um, to join forces in promoting democratic values in the Indo-Pacific uh, and beyond. And I'm assuming that this administration would agree with that. If so, what initiatives uh, does this administration intend to pursue to take advantage of that unique relationship, which really the U.S. and India have as the two largest democracies? That's right. Member Dean Thompson here with SCA. Thank you for the, the question. I think it's a, it's a timely one and an important issue to consider. Um, we are uh, right now uh, through our global comprehensive strategic partnership with India, looking at areas where we can work together uh, to strengthen across the region um, the, uh, the effects of uh, uh, the ability of countries to push back on malign influence and through the Quad Initiative, where we've brought in Japan and Australia as well, we have uh, a tremendous opportunity uh, to work together with four like-minded countries, uh, dem all democracies, uh, that are looking at ways we can help deliver uh, tremendous relief in the wake of COVID-19. That, that can look at how we set standards and work together on uh, critical technologies and uh, diversifying supply chains and uh, finally can uh, fight climate change and work uh, on improving uh, the environmental uh, situation across the region. So there is particularly exciting time on those fronts and uh, we look forward to continuing our work with India and our other partners. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I think I've got time to squeeze in one more question. Um, and I wanna uh, encourage you to continue uh, in, in the quad relationship. I think that's uh, uh, the chairman, Mr. Uh, Bear and I, you know, have been involved in that and have met with uh, the, the players in that. And, and uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity there. So we should take advantage of that. I mean, I want to conclude on, on Cambodia and kind of get the administration's uh, view uh, there. Congressman Lowenthal and I have worked on this for many years as head of the Cambodian caucus. And, and Hun Sen continues, obviously, crack down on the opposition party and civil society. What, what more can we do to actually make some progress uh, in Cambodia? Uh, is whoever wants to answer that briefly. Francisco, why don't you take that one? I'm happy to. Um, this is Francisco from East Asia Pacific Bureau. Uh, so as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, Deputy Secretary Sherman was just in Cambodia, uh, met with civil society, including opposition leader Kem Soka during her visit. 
Um, and I think one of the important things we'll be looking at is the upcoming elections in Cambodia, as well as broadening uh, the international community pressure, working with partners and allies to push for human rights issues in Cambodia um, as we sort of look towards the next couple months and years ahead. So, Thank you. My time's expired, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're seeing an era of what could be called uh, authoritarianism and imperialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, there's so much uh, for us to respond to in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Ms. Stone, I want to focus a bit on uh, the Rohingya. Our, our hearts naturally go out to the pro-democracy forces in Burma, Myanmar, and yet even uh, those forces have uh, been less than forthright in uh, recognizing uh, the, uh, the rights of the Rohingya people. Uh, there has been some vacillation. Uh, is it clear that uh, this new uh, government uh, council that has been organized is on record explicitly to give full citizenship and full citizenship documents to the Rohingya people, uh, and not just some of them, but all of those who are born either in the uh, camps or who are born uh, in uh, Burma, Myanmar. Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Let me start and then I can turn to Francisco for details. I'm not aware of a commitment to provide citizenship, but indeed the opposition has expressly recognized the rights of ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya, and indicated an intent to govern the country that's, in a way that recognizes if I can interject here, those are the weasel words that have upset me so much. People de asking for, for our help in the name of democracy, who then make statements like, oh, well, we'll follow the rules of Burma, Myanmar. Those, those law, existing laws are racist and discriminatory uh, and, uh, and, and, and set the foundation uh, for ethnic uh, cleansing. Uh, now that, and, and uh, I realize that uh, this question could uh, go to, uh, and probably should go to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, ben uh, Cosme, uh, uh, perhaps uh, he can uh, tell us, are we demanding in return for the help that we're offering uh, full citizenship and citizenship documents for the Rohingya, or are we just going to let them skate by with vague statements about loving minorities? Because and, and, and I want to interject their position, the position of some is they love all the ethnic groups and minorities of Burma, Myanmar, but the Rohingya, they're not Burmese, they're not counted, they're not citizens, and therefore they don't get citizenship papers. And so they can make statements about uh, how they love minorities of Burma, Myanmar, and at the same time be in favor of ethnic cleansing, genocide, whatever, uh, of the Rohingya people. How tough are we being on those who tell us that they share our values? Thank you, Congressman Sherman, for that question. Um, we, we have been in touch with the National Unity Government as well as other civil society groups. We have raised the issue of the Rohingya through our communication. Um, I will note that their recent statements, as you as you absolutely stated, is not is not what the entirety of what we would like to see it does talk about repealing. Um, and revising the 1982 citizenship law. It talks about um, examining issues of citizenship with respect to the Rohingya and actually made a huge declaration, which we see as a step in the right direction. Um, but as, as you completely um, you know, lay out, we, we wanna see more. Um, and we think that the pressure that Congress and, and the executive branch have put has been helpful towards um, reaching that goal. Okay, and then, uh... Ms. Stone, what are, are we doing uh, to um, highlight in Muslim countries how we are fighting to protect not only the Rohingya, but also the Uyghurs, while many Muslim countries are deporting Uyghurs back to China for torture and death? Did you mean to direct that, Congressman, to uh, Dean Thompson, to the SCA region? Uh, to the uh, uh, South and Central Asian Affairs uh, 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 region, um, 
but I'll, any any uh, any of the government witnesses can respond. Go ahead, Gene, please. Yeah, apologies. No, absolutely. We uh, we raise uh, at every opportunity uh, with the governments, particularly those uh, with Muslim majorities, uh, our concerns about what's happening with the Uyghurs. Urge them to be vocal. Urge them to stand up and stand united. Uh, and um, and be heard on this particular issue. We are, you know, very concerned. We are pleased that some have been supportive of the Uyghurs, but we are very concerned about those cases where Rafael Lamont may happen and want to make sure we avoid that. Thank you. We, if I can just interject, we have a very strong case to make to the Muslim world that we're fighting for the Rohingya, we're fighting for the Uyghurs, and uh, in both cases, we're doing far more than many Muslim majority countries and yet we're attacked as being uh, anti-Muslim, which is outrageous. I yield back. Great, thank you. Let me go ahead and now recognize the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms. Wagner. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, organizing the hearing, and I thank our witnesses for their time and service. The Indo-Pacific is home to some of the world's largest democracies and fastest growing economies. Yet, the People's Republic of China and its dictatorial partner states are exploiting crisis and instability to consolidate power, sow discord, and erode faith in democratic institutions. It is essential that we work with our democratic partners and allies in the region to restore respect for universal human rights and prevent the CCP from fostering a resurgence uh, in authoritarianism. Uh, the United States must engage with this strategically critically re critical region to secure a future in which the rule of law, free and fair trade, and strong dem democratic institutions underpin relations among Indo-Pacific states. Uh, Deputy Se Assistant Secretary Busby, I'm deeply worried uh, about, and my friend Mr. Sherman touched on this, deeply worried about China's genocidal efforts to destroy the cultural identity of Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Mongolians. Um, our CCP efforts to repress and brainwash dissenters and ethnic minorities, inspiring copycat programs elsewhere in the region, and how can the United States deter our punish implementation of these policies. Thank you, Congresswoman, for that very good uh, question. I don't think we've observed this elsewhere in the region. Um, uh, as Congressman uh, Sherman indicated, yes, uh, the, the Burmese government has repressed and excluded the Rohingya. That's going on for many, many years. Indeed, it predated uh, the Chinese government's current posture towards the Uyghurs. So we haven't seen replication in the region. That said, we are steadfast in trying to push back on what the PRC is doing towards the Uyghurs. As I mentioned, through statements, through sanctions, I should also note that through our engagement with business, uh, we are seeking to try to demonstrate uh, that US business, international business should not benefit from engagement with any Chinese corporations implicated in the persecution of Uyghurs. And for that reason, we are precluding the import of goods made with forced labor in Xinjiang. And we are also precluding both the export of goods from US companies uh, to companies involved in Xinjiang, as well as investment in those companies, uh, as was made uh, clear in the executive order that President Biden issued last week. Thank, thank you. Acting Assistant Secretary Thompson, how has China's Belt and Road Initiative been used to export authoritarian or, or road resistance to authoritarianism abroad? And how will the United States protect democracy in Belt and Road countries? Thanks for the question, Congresswoman. It's a very good point that uh, one of the things that China is looking for through its Belt and Road Initiative is the kind of influence uh, that would, you know, promulgate their system or their, their ideas. And so we, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working with countries to help them see the real uh, malign influence that comes uh, from being too closely aligned or, or engaged in this process. Um, we absolutely uh, look to call out and identify any efforts, um, you know, to draw these countries into a, a, you know, a debt trap relationship, 
uh, to, you know, to change their governing structures, anything like that. We also like to work with our civil society counterparts to make sure that they can help us spread that message, which can be more credible, often coming from within inside a country than, than externally. I have a brief time. I, I thank you for that answer. Uh, we have a national interest in sustaining U.S. leadership in Southeast Asia and promoting respect for democratic freedoms and articulating our strategic priorities, I think. This is why I introduced the Southeast Asia Strategy Act, which ensures that the United States engages proactively and meaningfully in this dynamic region. I'm happy to say that the House has unanimously passed this legislation, and I am hopeful that the Senate will take swift action. Deputy Assistant Secretary Busby, can you assess the health of d democracy in Southeast Asia, and what is the U.S. plan to prevent democratic backsliding in our Southeastern Asian partners? Thanks for the question, Congresswoman. Well, as I noted in my testimony and my colleagues did as well, unfortunately, there has been democratic backsliding throughout the region, much like as we, we have seen throughout the world. Uh, and we are trying to push back on that by, first of all, demonstrating to uh, the people and the governments in the region uh, that what the benefits of democracy are. And that's part of the reason President Biden has committed to holding a summit for democracies to show that uh, democracies can deliver. Um, we are also trying to bolster the role of civil society uh, throughout these countries because we believe that independent civil society can call attention to human rights abuses, to corruption, uh, can help hold governments accountable when they aren't addressing the needs of their people. Thank you. I'm way over my time. I appreciate the chair's indulgence and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Mr. Chairman, thank you to the witnesses. Uh, just changing the subject a little bit, the unrest in Burma doesn't seem to be subsiding anytime soon, and regional di diplomacy, I believe, is going to be crucial to bringing some resolution to the current conflict. Now, some countries in ASEAN have been uh, very outspoken against the coup, but others and the association in general have offered more tepid uh, responses and or, or rebukes. Now, I understand the five point uh, consensus agreement from the summit in April was a good start, but it's very vague and it doesn't have any details about how ASEAN can enforce it. And you saw evidence of this earlier in the week when the junta ignored the pleas from the ASEAN members to release the prisoners and they wouldn't engage in any dialogue to bring peace to the country. I wonder what our government, our State Department, is doing to shore up ASEAN or pressure some of those countries to be sure we're all working in concert and are committed to the efforts to bring some resolution to this conflict. Francisco, why don't you take this one? Congresswoman, thank you so much for that question. Uh, part of Deputy Secretary Sherman's uh, recent visit to Southeast Asia was in part to uh, signify U.S. leadership on, on making sure that ASEAN played a very constructive role uh, in resolving the human rights crisis in Burma, um, whether it was in uh, Bangkok uh, or in Cambodia um, or Indonesia, um, she raised uh, the need for um, both bilaterally and collectively as, as an institution for ASEAN to uh, be firm and in, in sort of uh, holding up their five consensus plan, as well as releasing um, uh, you know, uh, prisoners like Aung San Suu Kyi and others. Um, I think that I, we, we agree with your assessment in terms of some of the challenges we've seen on sort of building that uh, diplomatic um, pressure, uh, but at the same time, um, also think that the consensus was uh, an important opportunity to uh, show leadership on behalf of ASEAN. And I think there's also other countries in, in the region like Japan and Korea who are also stepping up to their plate. Well, I'm glad to hear that because as we try to reestablish our position internationally, we're going to have to work with uh, other organizations and former allies. We can't go it alone. So I think the new administration 
recognizes that and seems to be taking some steps in that direction based on what you said. Uh, I would, you mentioned uh, uh, somebody did earlier backsliding in some of these countries, democratic backsliding. We're seeing that everywhere. But one country I'd like to ask about is Mongolia. That's a country we really need to uh, be friends with. And they have been good partners. They've been moving towards uh, democracy. They're holding presidential elections now, but they're in a very dangerous neighborhood and a precarious position, both politically and economically. I wonder what the State Department and USAID are doing to engage Mongolian officials. Uh, are we we're trying to reinforce democratic resilience? Are we watching that election? Because there have been some parties within the country that have uh, taken actions that might have undermined the democratic process. I know the Desert Research Institute here in Nevada has a, a project there with the cloud seeding to deal with the snowstorms, and we're working with some of the women's groups on cashmere production, but uh, that's just a small piece. So what's the general policy, if you can address that? I'm happy to take that question again, uh, Congresswoman. Um, we've been um, very concerned about uh, recent developments in Mongolia. Um, we've reiterated um, through our embassy that um, healthy major parties um, on both sides uh, of the upcoming elections are important for uh, democracy in Mongolia. Um, at the same time, we, we do believe there's still a strong commitment um, to democracy. Um, and, you know, that it's still within the U.S. strategic interest for Mongolia to be a stable and viable democracy. Um, and we've um, asked our counterparts uh, to advocate that all issues of qualifications of candidates um, be uh, made in accordance to, to Mongolian law, but also international obligations um, in, in terms of human rights. It's harder and harder for us to be the set the example for how elections should run. I'm surprised some people haven't sent folks over here to observe our own, but at least we're trying to send the right message. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Dr. Green. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member, member for holding this meeting today. And I want to thank our witnesses for being here. I'm out in my district, a rural part of my district, and so I. I thought I'd just take a little bit and share what their perspective is on uh, democracy in the region. And it really mostly centers around what's going on with China. You know, all too often, I think we make the mistake that the people of China and the Chinese Communist Party or CCP are the same, but it's important to remember that the desire for freedom and a demand for self-reliance and human rights exists throughout much of the population of China. It's not so, of course, with the totalitarians of the CCP and in particular Xi Jinping. President Xi has ushered in an unprecedented era of authoritarianism not seen since Mao's years. From tearing down crosses at churches and erecting his own image in their place, to cultural and ethnic, ethnic genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, Xi has gone beyond even Deng Xiaoping, who was, for, was only a few years removed from Mao. Let me take a moment and frame the mindset of the current CCP leadership in a historical context. After Tiananmen Square, where hundreds, potentially thousands of protesters were massacred, President Bush sent former Secretary of State Kissinger on a secret mission to China. He observed, and I quote, the Chinese leaders were stunned by the reaction of the outside world. They could not understand why the United States took umbrage at an event that had injured no American material interests, end quote. A party official told Kissinger again, quote, we don't like to hear that, our, that others ask us what to do. Americans like to ask others, do this or do that. The Chinese people do not want to yield to others, end quote. Fast forward to when Nikki Haley was serving as ambassador to the United Nations, confronted the Chinese delegates about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. She essentially said that their leaders were shocked. We didn't understand that these were just terrorists. They seemed to communicate a, a, a right to wipe the Uyghurs off the map for the acts of a few criminals, and the world had no right to tell them what to do. Now, the current communist emperor in China has made it clear they still don't want to be lectured on human rights, human dignity, and the value of freedom. But that doesn't mean we don't have options or an obligation to live within our values. Recall after the Holocaust the phrase, never again. The world can never again sit by and tolerate genocide. We acted in Rwanda, and we have an obligation to act now because never again is happening again in Xinjiang. 
The question, of course, is, you know, what does that look like? Because while China asserts its Westphalian right to have no country meddle in its internal affairs, the United States has a right, and I said above, an obligation <clears throat> to choose with whom we do business and how we support our allies. Militarize the man-made islands in the South China Sea against the findings of an international court, we have every right to navigate those seas. Conduct debt trap and wolf warrior diplomacy with our allies, well, we will work to reverse the economic freedoms that we granted. Steal the intellectual property of our companies, we will continue to sue in court and create legislation and agreements which force China's hand. Hack our defense systems to advance their own military buildup so through might they can continue their intimidation, well, we'll shift forces to the Indo-Pacific and we'll build the advanced weapon systems which with which no nation in the history of man has ever been able to compete. If, there's, if they were so good at it, why would they steal ours? The choice is and always has belonged to the leadership of the CCP. America worked to grow our relationship with China, and as the country opened up and stood up, to use Deng and Mao's own words, that improved relationship with us and our friends, along with a good bit of intellectual property theft, and to be honest, a lot of hard work by industrious Chinese people has created an economic powerhouse. But the termination of the grace we gave, in light of the return to an authoritarian implementation of socialism and communism, is our right as well. And China should not be surprised by our response. America has a right to choose how we interact with nations, behave responsibly, and see a flourishing friendship. Wrongfully imprison an entire people group, and well, we're going to act. Create the lie that a pandemic started in a wet market from a pangolin that no one has found yet to hide a likely laboratory leak and your own culpability? Well, don't be surprised when the rest of the world is pissed off and expectant of some restitution for those losses. The people of China should understand the new situation of, of a world standing up to the, the, to the CCP is a result of their authoritarian actions, specifically the totalitarian leader of Xi Jinping. We want nothing more than a great relationship with the Chinese people. However, Xi's actions are deplorable and they violate the very human right of freedom and self-determination. And the United States has every right to choose our partners based on their conduct and values. My only question to our witnesses today is, can you describe how Xi Jinping is different from his predecessors in regards to human rights and relations with the West? And given that your time's expired, if someone wants to give a, a quick response. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Let me respond quickly. Congressman, thank you for that statement and the question. Uh, we do believe that Xi Jinping has been more repressive than his predecessors. He's consolidated power in a way uh, that hadn't occurred uh, previously, and at least in recent years, and uh, that the scale of the abuses has indeed increased uh, under his rule. You're absolutely right to point out that there's a difference between the Chinese government between the uh, PCC, CPP rather, and the people of, of China. And President Biden and Secretary Blinken have not shied away from calling out Xi Jinping for his abuses against the Uyghurs and against others. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I associate myself with Dr. Green's remarks and having been in Chengdu on June 4th, 1989, um, I, you know, the repression of the Uyghurs, the Tibetans and others is just all the way to Hong Kong. It's just horrifying. But let me start by who was a uh, young girl on May 24th the managing editor of the news outlet Frontier Myanmar. He's been on the reality of life in Burma after the February 1st military coup, a dangerous yet essential job that journalists are doing at unwarranted risk to themselves. But old Secretary Blink, I'm huge closely to bring Danny home something that's just got to happen immediately. I understand that folks here today aren't from the state consular affairs team, so may not be able to speak directly related to this case, but I want to use this opportunity to share my thanks and to ask you to continue doing everything you can to home safely as soon as possible. 
Mr. Busby and Mr. Ben Cohen, can one of you share in specific terms what the administration is doing to address the danger journalists are facing in Burma and ensure those who are detained are released unconditionally? Let me start and then turn it over to Francisco. Let me say- Somebody, Jen, my time's ticking. <laughs> yes. Let me begin by saying that generally we are trying to support independent journalists as much as we possibly can. The environment right now is a very tough one for them, but uh, we have programs uh, uh, that support independent journalism. And diplomatically, uh, we are also speaking out uh, in defense of journalists. That said, those who are trying to get out of Burma because they think the danger is too great, we are also doing our best uh, to protect them. Let me turn it over to Francisco for details on the particular case of your constituent that you raised, Congressman. Thank you, Congress, uh, Congressman. Uh, the welfare and safety of U.S. citizens um, is one of the highest priorities that we have here in the U.S. government. Um, we have both raised consistently and at high levels um, the military regime to release um, both Daniel Fetzer and Nathan Mong, another uh, American journalist, um, immediately and, have con and will continue to do so uh, until they are allowed to return home safely to their families. Um, as you alluded, um, our consular officers have sought to visit Daniel, um, but have thus far been unafforded um, access to him by uh, military officials. And so we will continue to ask the Burmese military uh, for consular access as required by the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations without delay. Thank you. And I'm not sure. Andy, are you still there? All right. Uh, let me turn to South Africa. In Bangladesh, pardon? Yes. Uh, 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 you hear me? We can hear you. It seems like you've got oh, a boy. action. So. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm here. Andy, it seems like you've got a bad connection. You're going in and out, so you can go can you and try to ask a question. Mr. Chairman, here, but I don't. Andy, can you hear us? Maybe the staff can work on um, Mr. Lowe. All right. I, if you can hear me, let me go, or I can, you can come back. Okay. Why don't Why don't we have the staff work on Mr. Levin's connection? And let's go on to the the, the next um, member. Um, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all our witnesses for your testimony today. Let me start with uh, uh, Advisor Ben Cosme. And, and I'm, am I pronouncing that right, uh, Mr. Ben Cosme? Oh, thank you very much. And, and thanks for your service and your testimony where you rightly uh, point out that the PRC continues to undermine Hong Kong's autonomy and civil liberties despite its obligations under uh, the Joint Declaration and International Law. Um, and my, my question to you is about the Biden administration's policy specifically uh, related to Hong Kong. Um, what is the administration's policy in response to China's violation of international law and anti-democratic aggression in Hong Kong? You, you testified that we will examine all available policy tools to promote accountability for, for the Beijing and Hong Kong officials responsible. Uh, also, the administration uh, issued uh, a, a document, the Interim National S uh, Security Strategic Guidance, and in that document, the Biden administration uh, committed to working alongside allies to, quote, stand up for democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. I applaud the administration for those statements, but can you give me some more specifics? What, what is the policy specifically to support pro-democracy um, uh, uh, activists in uh, Hong Kong? And, um, uh, and, and given uh, Hong Kong's authorities against opposition figures and, and Beijing's tightening control of Hong Kong's elected bodies, uh, is Hong Kong a lost cause or what is it that we can do? Uh, to respond to, to Chinese aggression there. 
Thank you for that question. I'll, I'll start off and then maybe turn to uh, PDAS must be in case I forgot anything, but I think you're absolutely right that um, our strategy um, and lines of efforts include one, um, it, increasing partners and allies um, condemning the recent actions um, in, in sort of degrading the autonomy in Hong Kong. That includes getting countries like the UK, uh, European partners, um, as well as Canada and others to really speak out um, against human rights abuses in Hong Kong. And second, it also means imposing costs for abusers, whether they be Chinese or Hong Kong officials. So for example, we earlier this year, we imposed sanctions um, on individuals and making sure that they uh, don't continue to act with impunity. Um, and third, it, when, whenever possible, supporting activists um, and the Hong Kong people, whether it's through civil society support or uh, through uh, those who are trying to flee, um, you know, sort of the, the, the clause of the national security law. So to turn over to Pete S. Busby in case there's anything else. No, nothing to add. Francisco, I think you covered it well. Yeah, thanks to both of you. And, and the sanctions piece, I think, is important, um, you know, supporting civil society, supporting those uh, opposition uh, figures uh, in Hong Kong, important. Um, I, I do hope there is a future for peaceful political opposition in Hong Kong, and I hope it is not a lost cause. Let me turn uh, to uh, Taiwan. We don't want what happened in Hong Kong uh, and the national security law there to happen to Taiwan. Um, uh, the lifting of the restrictions on pork imports uh, from the United States was seen as a good faith step by the Taiwanese to work towards a more comprehensive trade deal with the United States. Secretary Blinken confirmed with me yesterday that indeed the Biden administration and uh, Trade Representative Tai will be working towards perhaps a bilateral agreement there. Um, uh, the CCP uh, uh, would obviously not want to see a bilateral trade deal between the United States and Taiwan. Are we seeing the CCP attempt to influence the upcoming referendum on this, uh, on the restrictions on pork imports? Uh, are we seeing the CCP attempt to influence that? Are we seeing the CCP uh, attempting to undermine the potential for trade talks? I personally don't know the answer to that, Congressman. We'll need to get back to you. I can say that the CCP, the CCP definitely sought to influence the recent presidential elections in Taiwan. And we worked closely with the authorities in Taiwan uh, to help them push back against that. And they did so more successfully than many other, uh, many other uh, governments in the world have done. Thank you. And, and real quick, uh, Dean Thompson, um, what do our um, do our uh, export import bank and um, development finance corporation do they have access to intel to to better counter belt and road do they have access to the intel on on countering those investments with investments of their own congressman thank you for the question i believe they do and we work very closely with them uh, to look at ways to leverage what they can bring to the table, both in terms of direct financing as well as leveraging other capital that may be out there. I think DFC and XM are important tools in countering Belt and Road. Thank you uh, for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Can you go back? Great, thank you. I noticed that Mr. Levin's back. Um, Andy, can you check your audio? Yeah, can you hear me, Ami? Great, so let's go ahead and give you two minutes um, back if you Thanks want to Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Very sorry about that. Um, in Bangladesh, almost 10 years after the Rana Plaza disaster, we're seeing challenges to unions. The, uh, the landmark accord on fire safety and building, fire and building safety is in danger of, of unraveling, and U.S. companies never even joined it. My first trip abroad as a member of Congress was to Bangladesh, where I talked to workers and union organizers about the challenges, uh, challenges they face as well as going to the Rohingya refugee camps. More than four and a half million people work in 4,500 garment facilities, making Bangladesh the second largest garment exporter in the world after China. According to the New York Times, under the Fire and Safety Building Accord, more than 120,000 fire building and electrical hazards were fixed. Nearly 200 factories with 2 million workers lost their contracts because of poor safety standards after more than 38,000 inspections. Mr. Busby and Mr. Thompson, will this administration work with me to support Bangladeshi workers' freedoms uh, to form unions 
and to extend and expand specifically what is arguably the most effective worker safety agreement ever achieved since the dawn of the global anti-sweatshop movement in the 1990s. Let me start by just saying, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question, first of all, and we are absolutely committed to working with you uh, to pr protect and promote worker rights in Bangladesh. Over to Dean Thompson for more details. Thank you. And let me just echo, uh, absolutely, we would, we would look forward to that. And, uh, you know, we are very engaged uh, in working with uh, not just ourselves, amongst ourselves at the U.S. government, but uh, with like-minded partners and the ILO uh, to work with um, unions and other forces in Bangladesh that are looking to bring change. And we will continue to do that and look forward to the opportunity uh, as you okay, okay but i'm asking for a specific answer to my question on the accord on fire and building safety which has been ex the negotiations have been extended is will the united states commit to work with me on that yes sir yes sir. absolutely okay thank you thanks mr <laughs> chairman sorry for the technical difficulties great let me now go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from pennsylvania miss hulham Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my questions are first for Mr. Thompson. Uh, in the United States uh, and India are the world's two largest democracies. And as a consequence, I believe that we're uniquely poised to join forces in promoting a democratic uh, system and democratic values in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, specifically and probably beyond. My question for Mr. Thompson is, would you agree with that? And if so, what kinds of initiatives uh, is the administration intending to pursue or already pursuing to be able to pair those two great democracies with one another? Thanks, Congresswoman. Uh, it's a great it's a great point and one we absolutely agree with uh, in terms of the the, the 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 vast possibilities of our relationship with India. As I mentioned earlier, we have a global comprehensive strategic partnership with India. We are looking at ways to both strengthen India's ability to be a, um, a positive player and, and uh, uh, influencer uh, throughout the region. And when you bring in the Quad uh, member countries as well, the, uh, the Quad relationship is extremely important because of the ASEAN centrality uh, and the vast regional reach that it has uh, for us to be able to, to bring uh, uh, these kind of democratic ideals across the board. Um, I would uh, also um, note that our, our ability to leverage each other's assistance programs and, uh, 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 you know, complement one another, uh, where relationships may be stronger between us in a country versus India in a country or vice versa, uh, there's a great, um, you know, uh, leveraging opportunity there. So uh, I'll leave it there. Perhaps Craig or someone else might have something. I, I actually have a little bit of a follow on question as well, um, which is, although, of course, there are two great democracies, uh, democracies, including ours and Indians, are not without their, their flaws and problems. And I do have a pretty big uh, Kashmiri population in my, in my community. And there is you know, of course, concern uh, about uh, the treatment of the Kashmir pe Kashmiri people. Uh, what is the dialogue uh, that is ongoing between the administration and the Indian government uh, on these human rights issues um, uh, broadly, if you could share a little bit there? Uh, yes, Congresswoman, happily. The, uh, you know, the, the, the administration routinely raises uh, issues related to a vast uh, array of, of rights and, um, and uh, democratic issues with India. Kashmir is uh, one area where we have urged them to return to normalcy as quickly as possible, uh, including uh, we've, we've seen some steps taken, the release of prisoners, uh, the uh, restoration of uh, 4G internet access, things of that nature. There are other electoral steps we'd like to see them take uh, and that we have enc encouraged them to do and will continue to do so. Uh, thank you. And for the remainder of my time uh, for Mr. Busby, I have a question that relates to protests that are, of course, ongoing around the world, whether it's Hong Kong or Thailand or Burma, we're seeing a lot of people, particularly young people, and especially women, uh, leading the charge and pushing for reforms you know, for, uh, in, in many of these nations. What uh, can the United States be doing to help support those young people, and particularly women who are engaged in these political movements? Uh, and can we do so without feeding into the narrative that these movements are facilitated by our uh, and foreign interference? 
Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Well, first of all, uh, you probably heard the secretary indicate our steadfast support for the right of peaceful assembly. And we articulate uh, our commitment to that right and that others should respect that right whenever these types of protests uh, occur. Uh, as you rightly note, standing by and supporting the youth of these countries is very important. Uh, we continue to uh, support the Waisili program, program uh, in Asia, which is involves engagement with the young people of that region to expose them to America and American values. We have a similar program with young African uh, leaders. So that's one way of maintaining our engagement and support for young people who are engaging in these sorts of activities. And then as to women, uh, we continue to have women specific programs, programs that are devoted to women's empowerment, as well as programs to uh, promote and protect women's rights. And indeed, uh, we continue to have an office specifically devoted to women's issues here at the State Department that is focused on these issues. And we'd love to very much my office to work with you on those issues uh, in particular, real passion spots for me. And with that, I appreciate your time, gentlemen, and I yield back. Great. Let me now go and recognize a gentleman from California, Mr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bear, for holding this important meeting. And thank you to our witnesses uh, for your public service and your time today. I'd like to follow up on Representative Sherman's questions about Burma. Uh, first of all, what the military did in Burma was wrong. Uh, they should be removed from power and doing a coup is completely unacceptable. My questions relate to the relatively newly formed national unity government in opposition uh, to this military coup. I note that prior to this military coup, the government in Burma was essentially uh, what the doing what the UN called um, having genocidal intent in slaughtering the Rohingya, sexual assaults of Rohingya, brutalizing the Rohingya. A number of these very same members of that government are now part of the national unity government. I'm disappointed they refuse to recognize uh, the citizenship of the Rohingya, but I'm also really troubled they don't even have a representative of the Rohingya in this national unity government. So my question to Ms. Ben Cosme uh, is, is the U.S. or has U.S. recognized this national unity government yet? Uh, thank you for that con uh, question, Congressman Liu. Um, the U.S. Um, has met with the national unity government as part of its outreach to uh, civil society in response to the coup. Um, we continue to support, uh, you know, democracy forces inside the inside the country as well as those who are fleeing. Um, but on the question of recognition, we have not made a decision. I request that we not recognize this national unity government until they commit to having a representative of the Rohingya in uh, their national unity government. And I just note that this is one of the darkest days of despair for them. They are out of power and exile. They may never get back. And even during these very dark days, they still can't manage to say they'll give citizenship to the Rohingya. They still can't manage to have a representative of the Rohingya in the government. Imagine what they're gonna do if they ever get back in power. I'm gonna tell you what they're gonna do. They're gonna do the same thing they did before, which is to slaughter the Rohingya with genocidal intent. That's what they did before this coup. That's what they're gonna do afterwards because they made zero, zero commitments to not do that in terms of having citizenship and having a representative of the Rohingya so I request the State Department not to recognize them and be very forceful in demanding these changes. And as Representative Mark Green said, never again. I hope the State Department honors uh, that thought. My next question is to Secretary Thompson. It's about uh, Pakistan. At a prior hearing of uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee, there was a hearing on Afghanistan. It was brought up how important Pakistan was uh, to the future of Afghanistan. And my question to you is, the State Department recognizes that Pakistan is a critical ally of the United States. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm just curious, because I asked this question to the prior hearing, I didn't get a very good answer to it. There was a climate summit earlier this year where there was a meeting of uh, 40 world leaders, they got exclusive invitations. 
and the leaders of India and Bangladesh were invited to this exclusive meeting with the president. And um, Pakistan was not invited to that exclusive meeting, even though according to the Global Climate Change Risk Index, Pakistan is fifth in terms of being most vulnerable to climate change. And then when you look at the list of 40 countries, Pakistan was basically bigger than about 35 of those countries that were invited to this exclusive meeting with President Biden. So I'm just wondering, what was the thinking there uh, of excluding the leader of Pakistan from that meeting? Thanks, Congressman. Um, I can speak a little bit to this, uh, but um, may have to take the question to get you a more fulsome answer uh, if, if, um, if I can. But uh, my understanding is the invitations for the summit itself were primarily among the largest emitters and that Pakistan didn't fall into that category, but that there was an opportunity then uh, for leaders from uh, several other countries to uh, sort of have a, um, uh, a discussion about the issues uh, as a way of, of, of broadening that, uh, that discussion. Um, that was sort of the extent I was involved with it. I'm happy to try to get more information for you. Thank you. I don't think it's actually true um, in terms of emitters, because there were much smaller countries that emitted far less that were also invited to this meeting. And I just want to close by saying the State Department just needs to be sensitive to potential snubs. You, you can't just sort of invite a leader of India and Bangladesh to a meeting with the president, but not the leader of Pakistan. They're just not going to take it the right way. That's one reason we have the State Department, so that we don't have these kinds of snubs happen diplomatically. With that, I yield back. Great. Thank you. Let me go ahead and recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, Ms. Spanberger. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. To our witnesses, thank you for being here. I truly appreciate your time. Uh, my question today is really focused on freedom of the press, which is uh, something that we've discussed specific uh, to particular journalists so far. But um, it, you know, recognizing that freedom of the press is really foundation of the foundational to the protection of human rights and to democracy. Um, and since we've seen since COVID uh, and the pandemic has begun, that there really is an importance of objective reporting uh, in public health, as an example. And when freedom of the press is hampered, so uh, is the ability of uh, everyday citizens to separate fact from fiction and navigate an increasing presence of misinformation and disinformation. Um, but across the world, there are many countries where it, it does remain very dangerous to be a journalist. Um, and this is particularly concerning to me as we see that journalists around the world are really facing increasing crackdowns and constraints. And we've seen this in South Asia in particular. So, um, Mr. Busby, Mr. Thompson, I was wondering, could you please provide an assessment of freedom of the press um, in countries such as India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, for example, um, and what threats to journalists uh, individuals may be uh, facing or experiencing there or, or elsewhere in the region? Thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. We couldn't agree more on the importance of a free and independent press, and we indeed uh, speak out in favor of a free and independent press wherever there are threats to freedom of the press. And we also have a variety of programs, some of which the State Department administers and some of which USAID administers, dedicated to uh, freedom of the press. I would note that a couple years ago, the UK started something called the Media Freedom Coalition, a specifically designed to address threats to press freedom and we are working very closely with the UK uh, in speaking out on individual cases as well as supporting uh, journalists generally around the world who are threatened. Let me turn it over to Dean now for a specific uh, analysis of the South Central Asia region. Thanks, Scott, and thank you for the question, Congresswoman. It remains, as Scott said, an area that we watch very closely and, in fact, work um, with many different journalism groups uh, to try to continue to promote freedom of press, freedom of expression uh, in, in all the countries in the region. Um, it's a little hard to give you one answer uh, because each country has some different issues. Certainly, we have been concerned uh, in Pakistan and Bangladesh with regard to some of the restrictions uh, on journalists uh, that have been there. Uh, similarly, at times, that has happened in India, though I think India, we can say, has a very vibrant press overall. Uh, that uh, reports very freely uh, on its government. But just getting back to the to the specifics of what we do, 
Um, I think that, you know, with our, our uh, uh, colleagues from AID, with our colleagues from DRL, uh, we are always looking for ways to help build the capacity and ability of journalists to report uh, and broaden the um, um, uh, knowledge base, if you will, of the citizenry. As you rightfully noted, COVID has been a tremendous example of where information is critically important and access to information has to be protected. And, and challenges that may or may not be impacting the press, do you see any, um, any particular uh, problems that those present for, for you all in, as it, as it um, relates predominantly to diplomacy um, uh, in communicating our message, our values, our purpose in engaging? Um, are there any challenges that from an American perspective um, facing out that you may see in terms of um, issues related to a free press overseas? Scott, if it's okay, maybe I'll start that. Um, I would say it can be an issue, of course, if, you, if you're dealing with a country that has a restricted press uh, environment, uh, and in which case we will look for alternate ways uh, to get our message across in a broad number of ways. So. Uh, you know, there, there may be government outlets, there may be private outlets, there may be social media opportunities. Um, we're quite interested in looking at where are the people looking for news and where are they getting their information and how can we take that to them uh, in a number of different ways, uh, whatever the media might be. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I, I appreciate your last comment. Certainly uh, in our other subcommittees, we've heard from um, from uh, journalists in other parts of the world and other regions where um, people do really get creative in how they disseminate information and ensure uh, that, that good quality information is out there um, uh, in other places as well. So thank you for your answers, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. Thank you for that. And I know, um, I think we lost Mr. Chabot to um, technical issues. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, make some closing remarks and, you know, again, want to thank the, the witnesses for, you know, your public service and, and your continued work to uphold um, our democratic values um, in the region. And, you know, I think this subcommittee, as well as members of Congress, as you've heard today, a lot of work in a bipartisan way with the administration to, to strengthen those values. And, and I know when I think about the, the region and think about the, the great um, power competition with China. I often think about it in terms, obviously there's a, you know, economic competition, influence competition, but there's a competition of values. And, you know, the more we can do to strengthen our relationship with like-minded allies and like-valued allies, you know, such as um, some of the initiatives with the Quad, you know, some of the, the, the conversations taking place, you know, to, to set the rules of norms, you know, there, there is a, a a competition of those values here in the 21st century. And I think it's um, pertinent to the people of the world that democratic values, free market values, the human rights that come with that actually win the day. So again, thank you for your work in, in these areas. We look forward to working um, with each of you um, as we move those values forward. Um, and with that, I will bring this hearing um, to a close and the meetings adjourned.